Hi friends, today we start lecture 72 in our helicopter dynamics course and today I'm going to look at the flap, lag and torsion equations, specifically the coupled motion and we are going to look at the elastic plate. I'm Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now essentially by now you have realized that if we want to develop a comprehensive model of the rotor blade, then we should consider all these elastic motions. And these motions specifically would include flap, lag, and torsion. Because this blade is essentially very slender and therefore there is motion in all these three directions. Now the problem is that the derivation of such equations become very complicated. The equations are very lengthy and they take a lot of time and effort to derive. And actually, long time ago, a lot of effort was spent by dynamics researchers in deriving these expressions, and these expressions are given in various forms in the literature. I'm going to just discuss those in the next slide. Now, these equations as derived by different people are somewhat different because they would often retain different nonlinear terms. They would take different hinge sequences and so on. So let's look at some of the published derivations which are very important from a historical perspective. So one of the first derivations is by Hobalt and Brooks in 1958. This is primarily a linear derivation. Then Hodges and Dowell actually derived the nonlinear equations in 1974. A new set of equations was derived by Johnson in 1977 and further papers have been published. So again, I have given the full outline of these different works. So you can see here the Hobalt and Brooks technical report from NASA. It's a very important and seminal document. This is in 1958. This is a linear derivation. Then the Hodges and Dowell derivation. This became the benchmark or the Philosophy behind many codes, such as the UMAR code, developed at the University of Maryland and used in multiple places. And then there is also derivation by Wayne Johnson, who has written the book Helicopter Theory. And this is also published as a NASA technical report. So let's look at the basic philosophy of derivation of these equations. We are not going to go into detail here, but I'm going to give you a flavor of some of these equations. So essentially you have the blade and there is what is known as an undeformed blade or coordinate system. And then the blade deforms to some point here and this point P moves to some point P dash here. And essentially using this particular motion, we then derive the equations for the blade. So there is a lot of coordinate transformation involved. There is a lot of force summations involved. Typically, Hamilton's principle is often used to derive these equations. Now, the blade is considered to be a twisted beam here. And due to the pitch twist distribution, there is a structural coupling between the out of plane bending and in plane bending. So remember that for a blade we are considering here, the flap motion is out of plane bending, the lag motion is in plane bending. Now the deflection of the blade is given in terms of certain coordinates or certain values. So we can think of the axial deflection, the lead lag deflection, the flap deflection, the pitch and the elastic twist. So typically we use W for flap, V for lag, theta for blade pitch, and phi for the torsion. So note that there is a difference between the blade pitch and the torsion. The blade pitch is something which the pilot or a control system is giving to the blade. So this is the theta psi motion. And the twist is actually what is coming out of the blade as a displacement because the blade is actually a torsional bar. You can think of it like that. And therefore, these two are somewhat different. Phi is not in control of the pilot or the controller. It is something which the helicopter blade is actually giving out.
Now, certain approximations are made to simplify these equations. One is we consider a uniform blade, slender beam. We consider moderate deflection so that we do not retain all the nonlinear terms. We only retain certain nonlinear terms up to second order. And this essentially means that terms such as two displacements multiplied together are retained, but not three displacements multiplied together. So something like V dash W dash term would be retained, but V, w, v dash W dash square would not be retained. And also we are not considering any sweep or droop in the blade that further complicates the equation. So we are considering a uniform blade. Now, certain notations are used here. XA is the offset along the chord of the CG from the EA. This is positive aft or positive backward. Then of course we know EY, EIY is the flap stiffness and EIZ or EIZ is the chord by stiffness. GJ is the torsional stiffness. KA is the polar radius of gyration. M is the mass per unit length. M, KM1 square is the flap-wise principal mass moment of inertia. M, KM2 square is the corresponding chord-wise principal mass moment of inertia. And M, KM3 square is the torsional mass moment of inertia. So now I'm going to go straight to the equations because the derivations are mostly an exercise in mathematical jugglery. And in fact, if you have certain software such as Maple or Mathematica, you can derive these equations. But whether you want to do that is a questionable task because the derivations are extremely cumbersome. I remember doing some of these derivations during my PhD time, but I think nowadays most of the people are just taking these equations from books and papers and using them. So let's look at the equation for flap. And here when I say flap, I mean it is predominantly flap because you do see the term here W4, the fourth derivative of W. But because of the coupling, you also see the presence of terms involving V, involving phi and so on. So these are coupled flap bending, lag bending and torsion equations, but this is the one in the flap direction. So just to make a point, we can consider that if theta were to be zero and none of the couplings used to be there, then this equation would very much simplify. You would have the EIY W4 term, and then you would have the M W double dot term, and then you would have a forcing term here. But because of the presence of all these couplings, you get a large number of terms here. Now, you can consider some of these terms essentially coming from Coriolis forces, and some of these terms are also coming from centrifugal forces. Now, the advantage of looking at the dimensional form of the equation is whenever you are getting a omega square type of term, this is likely to come from a centrifugal force. And whenever you are getting a term involving only one rotation speed or one omega, then it is a Coriolis term. So you can look at the different terms here and figure out what is the source of these terms. Let's look at the equation in lag. Now this equation is very long and cumbersome, but you can of course see that some of the terms we have seen before when we looked at the simpler forms of the equation, that's when we were looking at only lag or flap and so on. But of course the basic term in the lag is there, the EIZ V4 term, and then there is the M V double dot term that would be there for a simple beam in lag. And then because of the presence of theta, all these coupling terms are coming in. And again, you have the terms involving Coriolis forces, which essentially show up with the one rotation speed term here. And then the centrifugal force terms, which come up when you have the square terms here. So omega squared terms represent the centrifugal force. And of course, on the right hand side, there is the aerodynamic force, which is acting in the lag direction. So that's the lag equation. Now we look at the torsion equation. So here again, we see that the basic flexural stiffness term is here, negative gj phi double dash, phi being torsion. And then you have 
the basic term involving inertia here, that is m km square phi double dot. And then the remaining terms are all coming because of coupling, the presence of theta, the presence of the tennis racket effect or propeller moment, and presence of certain nonlinearities is also there. On the right hand side, you essentially have the forcing function and one more term because of the difference in km2 square and km1 square. Now, there are some papers where you can get more information about these kind of derivation. Like I mentioned in the 70s and 80s, a lot of people were spending time in deriving these equations. And in fact, most of these equations were hand derived. So somebody would write it, publish it, and then somebody else would derive it and verify it and so on. And maybe they would spot some term which was missing and they would say that, okay, you need to take care of this term and so on. So there was a lot of discussion going on in the helicopter dynamics community as to which term is important, which term is not important, and so on. Later, when tools like Mathematica and Maple came up, people actually used symbolic computing to derive some of these equations, and then they were more sure of the different terms. Now, here are two papers. One is by Hong and Chopra. This is a derivation of um, composite blade equations, and another very classical paper is by Sevaneri and Chopra, who essentially used the FEM method for the rotor blade. So once you derive the governing equations, it is fairly easy to use these methods in the form of the Galerkin formulation, and then you can derive the equations and get the mass stiffness matrices and so on from these equations. Now, these equations can be used to yield the rotating frequencies if you only use linear terms. And um, a diagram of the rotating frequency versus the rotor speed can be obtained. This is known as the fan diagram. Sometime also it's called the Campbell diagram. At the nominal rotor speed, that is the rotor speed at which you are going to fly, or which is the baseline rotor speed of the main rotor, the natural frequency should not coincide with the multiple of the rotation speed. For example, if your first torsion frequency is 4.2 per rev, it's generally much better than if it is 4.02 per rev because that's getting too close to the 4 per rev. So that's a multiple of the rotor speed and you don't want this torsion frequency to come near the multiple of the rotor speed. That's not a good choice. So these are something to keep in mind. Of course, remember there is always damping present in the system. So you're not going to actually have resonance uh, as theoretically defined, but you are going to encounter high vibration if any of these situations do take place. So this is the basic fan diagram you can see here. And the fan diagram is essentially the rotating frequency plotted versus the rotor RPM. Now you can see the first chordwise or first lag frequency, the effect of centrifugal force is relatively less. This is mostly governed by flexural stiffness. For first flap, there is more effect. Second flap, there is more effect of the rotation frequency and so on. Now, typically, this is the sequence of the modes. In most cases, you have the first chord and first flap here. Then you have the second flap, second chord, you have the third flap, and so on. Now, sometimes you encounter a phenomena which happens that there is a modal change. So the third flap goes to some point, and then the third flap goes like this, and the first torsion goes like this. So all these kind of modal exchange can happen. And how you figure this out is you look at the mode shapes or the eigenvectors corresponding to the problem and then see which is the proper mode. You can figure that out by looking at the components of the displacement and matching it with the displacement vector which you have created for the FEM formulation. So this is the nominal rotor speed. And like I mentioned, at the nominal rotor speed, you should not cross multiples of the uh, the frequency should not cross multiples of the nominal rotor speed. Now, sometimes um, some lines are made here in terms of 1 per rev, 2 per rev, 3 per rev, 4 per rev, and that also helps you to locate where there is this kind of coalescence taking place between one of the per rev multiples and between the actual frequency. So that's also known as the Campbell diagram. Now, we can simplify these equations to get a closer look at this problem. And sometimes, you know, it helps you get rid of all these complicated terms and zoom in at the fundamental physics. So to do that, let us set certain terms to zero. So let's say we set xi to zero. That means the 
feather axis and CG axis coincide, we say theta is zero. That means there is no control twist. So essentially sine theta becomes zero, cos theta becomes one, sine two theta becomes zero, cos two theta becomes one, and a plethora of the terms in those equations will get decimated or will get simplified. We also assume pre-cone angle to be zero. So the advantage of this is some of those complicated terms are removed from the equation and we can get a more basic look at the fundamental terms in the equation. So let's now look at the flap equation to start with and then we'll look at the lag and torsion. So flap equation, of course, you are seeing the usual term EIYW4 that comes from your beam. You also have the MW double dot term that comes from your beam. So essentially, this is a partial differential equation, W here with respect to X and W here with respect to T. These are the derivatives. Now we see some term present here. This is, of course, a nonlinear term here. This we know is a centrifugal term here, which was present in the pure flap equation also. Uh, there is a term due to lag here, present here, and then there is one more Coriolis type of term here. Both of these are Coriolis type of term. I think I retained the beta here despite whatever I said before. So anyway, let's keep that here for now. And on the right hand side, there is the LW, which is the lifting force which is acting here, the aerodynamic force. And this is primarily going to come from lift because we are talking of the flap equation. Now let's look at the lag equation. So in the lag equation, again, we have the usual EIZ, W4 term. We have the MV double dot term. That These are the terms which would be there in a non-rotating beam. Now, because of rotation, we would get this centrifugal force term here. There is a dash here. There is another centrifugal force term here. So these two terms are purely coming from rotation and the lag direction. Now, there is a nonlinear term here. Because of deflections, there are two Coriolis type nonlinear terms here. And again, this leads to complexity of the equation. And on the right hand side, of course, you have the LV, which is the forcing in the lag direction. And this is going to primarily come from drag. So you are going to have both the induced drag and the profile drag here, and they are going to essentially cause this drag term. Torsion. Now torsion, let's look at it again from the fundamental perspective. You would get the flexural stiffness here. You would get the inertia term here. These would be present in a simple rod type of situation or a shaft vibration problem, which we have discussed before in one of the slides. I just wanted to bring out this basic equation here. And now because of the coupling, you have some nonlinear terms here. You have a centrifugal term here. You have a centrifugal term here. And then you have a moment term on the right hand side. And essentially, this moment is in the pitch direction. So this is coming from primarily the pitching moment coefficients and so on for the particular helicopter rotor. So if we are doing free vibration, which means we want to calculate the rotating frequencies, we can set the forces on the right hand side to be 0 and then solve the free vibration problem. We could also ignore the nonlinear terms uh, initially for linear vibration calculation, and that would essentially capture the centrifugal effects in the problem. Now, if people want to include the nonlinear terms, what they do sometimes is they do a kind of linearization of these equations. So they solve the equation once, and then they have some solution. And you can actually calculate the rotating beam frequencies about a certain steady state. So if you have the values for V, W, phi, and so on, you can actually calculate the stiffness and mass matrix based on those values. And that is going to give you the frequencies which are sometimes known as nonlinear frequencies, though there is some debate on the veracity of that term being used. So that was the basic outline about the equation. Like I mentioned, many years were spent in the derivation of the equations. Many of the people who worked on the derivations of these equations are the doyens in the field of helicopter dynamics. And uh, lately, the thinking has moved on toward multi-body dynamics for deriving many of these equations. Because as you can understand from the derivations, there was some physical reasoning often being used in terms of figuring out which term to keep and which term to neglect as far as the nonlinear terms were there.
And uh, there was also the possibility of people making mistakes in these derivation. Later on, people developed more complex and better ways to actually derive equations and those equations are sometimes framed in terms of variables such as Roderick's parameters and so on and they essentially let you calculate some of these things which with much greater correctness so for example the code VABS is based on some of these aspects so these are the variational approaches to solving this problem so I will stop this lecture here and I hope you enjoyed this lecture and enjoyed these equations which will suddenly after some time start talking back to you. I will see you in a video sometime soon. See you then.